So we come back to this question, who's your audience, right? So we covered this uh, when we, um, th last week when we talked about writing. Who are you writing to? Uh, we'll give you some real world scenarios why you can't just have, I mean, these books you should you know, absolutely um, produce and, and publish for yourself. But it, there are many instances, especially when you're job searching, where you can't send this, where you have to edit it. Um, and so we'll kind of look at examples of how to do that um, and what to look for, like what to achieve in the layout of the visual information. Mm -hmm. um, talk about publishing and model photography. Uh, okay, so who who's so who's the audience? I mean, we, that's kind of an easy one, but who is the audience? Who's looking at your portfolio? Who are you doing, you know, these books and the work samples for? The people who are hiring. Yeah. So. In, Huh? Yeah, the hiring yeah. Mm -hmm. that's an important distinction that I think we forget. We, we kind of get lost in our world of design and we start turning these things into beautiful art projects. And we forget that ultimately it's a marketing tool. You're trying to sell your services to someone. And that's fundamentally different than an art project. Mm -hmm. In which case it's your own pleasure, your own interests that are the most important. Right, so there, there are other architects. And why are they looking at it? What are they looking for? for qualification. Like what? What's a qualification? Like they have the skill they list on like what requirement like for example 3D or CAD or things so they try to see if you show this kind of drawing that show the, the evidence. Yeah, the so evidence. the question I'll repeat the comments. So the, the comment was that you know you claim that you know you know certain kinds of softwares and mm -hmm. digital tools and so in the portfolio, they look for the, the proof that you actually do do know, because they're looking for maybe um, drawings and renderings that you've created using those softwares that you claim to know. That's one, but um, you know, I, I, have to, I have to say that in most cases, most practitioners um, you know, who, are, who are tasked with hiring, um, they, get, they glaze over. Can you imagine? Mm -hmm. uh, how many times have you come across a rendering that is really well like very competent they're professional but photorealistic but it kind of has the same look and feel the same scale figures you know the same kind of sky the same kind of whatever so they see those kind of things one after another and they it's you know you just get desensitized yeah. right so that that's not impressive right so so sure so like you know but they want to see i mean um Drafted drawings and well-drawn details, those are always a plus, especially within a student project. But, I mean, it's an entry-level job. So mm -hmm. they're not expecting you to have this technical knowledge, right, to, um, I mean, they, they mm -hmm. you know. The reality is yet you'll have the basic skills, but the, the bulk of the training will happen in the office. So they're looking for something else. What are they looking for? Thought process. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thought process. They're looking for, are you a critical thinker? Can you think um, and explain your thought process visually, externally to somebody else? Because that's much harder to teach within the office, right? Um, yep. And who would like to venture a guess as to how, so, you know, when you bring, um, when you produce these portfolios and you look at them, when you show them to your peers or even your faculty, um, I mean, we're all proud of the accomplishments that are, you know, represented in these pages. Um, so we're very respectful, right? Because we understand how much work this means, this represents. Um, so we view them very respectfully. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, yeah. But you can guess where she's going with this. <laughs> <laughs> um, but how many, um, like, let's start with just time. Like, how many minutes would you guess um, uh, the person, the person who's reviewing this, um, spends to look through this? Like at what pace? Like, like read, read, read every read word? Read it, read it, just flip right through. Yeah, like... Are we talking about at the interview or before the interview? Well, so before the interview, so I've, I've had actually, um, so usually at when you're face to face, most people, you know, will also be respectful, right? Yeah. So yeah. But I, I have had this happen to me personally where, and the person, you know, said the disclaimer in the front. So don't take it this the wrong way. I do this at every interview. Um, but this is just how I start. So he literally picked it up and he did this. He didn't pause, he didn't slow down, he just went to front to end and then he started the interview, mm -hmm. right? 
um, so but typically it's it's the cutoff right it's it's um, the um, the first cutoff you know where the piles get split up but it could happen you know during the interview as well so what are, what are some how do we um, so in other words not enough time not as much time as you have spent uh, or your faculty will have spent looking at it not every word right mm -hmm. so how can they possibly understand like you know th this is a project semester-long research you know project how could they what, what do you think they'll get out of this by kind of looking at it that, at that speed so because they're looking for thought process right they're lo they want right. to see how you think and how you research how you integrate that information into an architectural decision but if they're not spending the time to actually study what it is that you're presenting in these pages I think it's the rhythm of project like uh -huh. do you have like really a stable thought process to each project because they can see if you have like you kind of set up like floor plan and then I mean diagram and then side plan, floor plan and then building uh -huh. and then does it repeat on each project or just go everywhere? Sure, so that's a very good comment so mm -hmm. I'll repeat yeah. it. So what Vu is sharing is that they're looking for a, a template, a pattern, yeah. right? In how the sequence of how the information is presented. You know, is there always um, a predictable rhythm, same pattern, where you start with um, something conceptual, an idea, and then that gets developed, and then there's a final, you know, set of drawings and renderings that represent, you know, what the proposal was. That's a good one. Mm -hmm. But what's another, um, you know, so if, if, w we can't re if we can't rely on the reviewer actually taking the time to absorb and digest the information, what ha what do we have to do when we think about laying out a portfolio? What can we do to help them? First of all, I need to make the graphic quality a little bit better to attract them, to make them get interested in this portfolio. And uh, if they want to read, it might be some words. Mm -hmm. Did you say pretty? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So that's a really good point. So yeah. what um, Dylan said is that, first of all, so if I were to paraphrase, first of all, it has to be visually attractive mm -hmm. enough and compelling enough for them to keep, you know, at least get to the end and perhaps come back to certain pages, right? I think, uh, on the, I don't know, it's kind of like design a billboard on the freeway or something because they're not going to pay attention to uh, the billboard a lot. Maybe just some keywords, uh, graphic. Well, why, why are billboards designed the way they are? Because you're driving really fast, you're not going to pay attention to mm -hmm. that. It's not that you're not going to pay attention. It's if you're going 60 miles an hour, you don't have 30 seconds to look at it. You have a very short window of time. It's quick. It's done. Over. You passed it. So you need something that's going to stay in your, in your memory, something that you're going to register with it. What are you going to take away from it? So how, how do you do that in a portfolio? Uh, like you said, it's really quick like that. Like someone just look at a portfolio like what Karen just did like that. Maybe person's not really interested in the entire portfolio. Maybe one of the pages is really interested. Mm -hmm. That's what I do when I go to a bookstore. You know? mm -hmm. yeah. it's like that. So it can be like the beginning of a chapter of each aspect of your portfolio that has that visual image. So the rhythm was mentioned and you talked about the graphic quality. But there has to be then some other aspect I in the portfolio, such as an image, that in the rhythm you would get the sense, oh, in that cadence, there's, there's something that also grabs the viewer. Mm -hmm. You know, we talked about the seven second cover letter, mm -hmm. and then there should be then a time element associated with just gleaning the portfolio page. Mm -hmm. and, ca and so the word impressions is related to a word that we discussed in the first seminar, mm -hmm. the first workshop. Mm -hmm. Do you remember what that word is? The impressions of you, but what was that word? Well, so it was, you know, his, his, even though he wasn't present, his yeah. name came up. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes, yeah. exactly. Your word. Yeah. <laughs> Your word, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's right. Right, yeah. so it's part of that. It has, so it has to be all consistent. Mm -hmm. Right, and so you know, I like Dylan's example because we've all done that. You know, not mm -hmm. just in reviewing other people's um, resumes, but we've all browsed and made a snap judgment about a magazine or a book, right? Where we say, oh, you know, I don't want to engage anymore, or oh, like this, I want to go back to that, or I want to engage more. So we can all take cues from that. Um, it's actually the bookstore is a 
perfect analogy. Yeah. I'm gonna steal, I've got a lecture at 12.30 on portfolio design, a mm -hmm. 3D class, so stealing it. But mm -hmm. when you go to the bookstore, how do you get, how do you decide that you wanna keep reading? How do you decide that you're not putting a book back into the shelf within the first, you decide what, 10 seconds? Yeah. Seven seconds, somewhere around there? Mm -hmm. Something that captures you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's a double-edged sword. If every image on the page captures you, mm -hmm. it, it's it's about rhythm and flow. It's you yep. want yeah. something to stick out. If everything is perfect, then what actually, what what do you remember? Yeah. Just get overwhelmed, and so then it becomes subtracting. Yeah. Or then you glaze over again, right? Yeah. Yeah. There isn't. A, yeah. Let's see. So. Um, so your portfolio, right? So you should cover the basics. So like in in um, in most cases, as a student portfolio, it's your studio projects. Um, but don't f uh, forget to include. So, in other words, um, uh, Vu brought up the point that you know you want to prove you know the your claims that you're making in your resume about you know these software skills you have. But also now let's add critical thinking skills um, and any kind of you know kind of uh, extra points you know where if you're uh, an exceptionally good uh, you know have a really good hand. So you know you you draw well and that's how you think. Um, or if you're an exceptionally good model maker or some other, right? So if those are coming from other classes uh, outside of the studio, you know, uh, find space. You can find space in your um, portfolio to include those as well. Um, That's a really good example mm -hmm. of the brand. Mm -hmm. I mean, we were looking earlier at the graphic designer's book, and it's all hand drawn. And you can tell the book is also handcrafted mm -hmm. with each page crafted with a set of images. So I think it takes you back to the branding aspect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very consistent. It's very um, clearly distinguishable, identifiable. But everything yeah. from signage to um, these are actually 3D. So there's a, there's a certain process. This is one of the, Marion Bonges is one of the biggest graphic designers in the world. So mm. this is her 10-year her, uh, monogram wow. where she did everything from covers for New York Times mm. and, and GQ to signage for Victoria's Secret. Mm -hmm. Right, and you know, and there's a consistent kind of look and feel. Like, you know, her, it pervades whether or not, like regardless of who the client was or what medium she used, there's a sensibility that's consistent that pervades. I was just listening to a, a podcast this morning by Chase Jarvis, and he was talking about this idea of what is your style? What's the thing that sets you apart? Mm -hmm. When someone sees something of hers, they can mm -hmm. always tell it's a Marion Bonges style graphic. Mm -hmm. Even if it's not her, you immediately go. And to the point where they realized that, uh, who was it, Pete Diddy did, a, did a, a shirt design and uh, was sued because it turned out that it was actually one of her graphics. But they took some of the elements out, but everyone recognized it as one of her pieces. Mm -hmm. Totally different industry. Mm -hmm. And, and you know the, uh, something that goes along with that, and this is something that um, you know. So I've been I've been talking to Sick about this um, based on last week's um, what we were doing with the the resume and the cover letter. So if you um, so you know um, making claims in the resume and making sure that your portfolio proves this one thing, but in the cover letter where there's a little bit more personality and nuance and a little bit more view that comes through. So in your cover letter, if you present yourself as somebody. Um, so you know, we'll use six example. You know, if you present, if he presents himself as somebody who um, learned how to iterate quickly based on his previous major, um, who is really facile with drawing and uh, you know making to test an idea, mm -hmm. and that this is what he excels in, that what he enjoys, then <coughs> we are looking for that in the portfolio, in the work samples, right? So then, in the work samples, I don't want uh, we would it, we would be you know, we would we would have the duck in the dog situation if he says that in the cover letter, but in the work samples we don't see any any evidence of that, right? So then that claim would sound hollow, right? Um, so it's it's really important that so there's um, there's consistency in terms of the claims that you make that the the material that you submit is supported, um, as well as this kind of a style and and I think you know it's it's it, some for some of you this may be tough because you're still uh, fairly young in your careers you may not be able to identify a certain style yet but you can use even you know those amongst you where um, you know it could be a certain um, 
I mean, fonts, I, I don't want you to go like clever on fonts, but you know, I, I think sometimes we've had the experience where we look at you know, your peers' work you know, without their names on the board and you recognize, oh, that's probably so-and-so's, mm -hmm. right? So that's what we want to start con continue to cultivate if you have something emerging already. And in the absence of that, don't try to fake one or try to come up with one in a short amount of time. Just you know, keep things simple and clean. That's kind of your mm -hmm. best bet. You know, an example to what yeah. Karen is alluding to is if you have a certain present, uh, drawing style, mm -hmm. representation aspect, I'm just thinking of people like uh, Morphosis mm -hmm. or Wes Jones, they have distinct methods that they convey mm -hmm. their ideas through representation. That can be your signature as well. That makes you distinct. Mm -hmm. So you have to develop those abilities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you know, start to identify them and really nurture it. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And just to just so that you know, we've covered the, the obvious. What's obvious to us may not be obvious to everybody. Um, uh, you, to you guys is that so you never send a resume in especially in our profession but all other visual fields you never send it in without a work sample and you'll actually see job postings where they'll say you know not everybody will bother to state that but they will say you know if we if they receive a resume without work samples they're just gonna ignore mm -hmm. it right just you know in the in the dump file mm -hmm. um, Let's see. So a lot of some of this is review, but I do want to. This is also point. Yeah. So I do want to. So this is pretty generous, and I'll show you some images where they're not that generous anymore. Um, okay. And so, oops, sorry. Other way. Huh? Right. So the reason why we have to in, um, in, uh, edit is look at this, two megs. Yeah. That's like by the way, that's that's, that's e right. that is easy to do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right? Uh -huh. yeah. Right. So so two megs to five megs. I've seen maybe ten, but I yeah. haven't come across fifteen yeah. recently. Yeah. I mean, you gotta th you gotta think about their servers. So that for you, it's like what's the big deal? It's just ten, fifteen yeah. megabytes. Mm -hmm. Okay, they might get six hundred resumes mm -hmm. in the first uh, twenty-four hours. Mm -hmm. So you start doing the math, and you're like, oh, that's right. We we just crushed their mm -hmm. their server. <laughs> and and to me. Um, and I, I, I ask of this in all of my classes, um, it just shows a level of care and empathy. Like you may be using like really fast school computers where you're not even paying attention to the file size. And so you may have no problem sending in you know, a PDF document letter size that's 300 megs. <laughs> to me, that just looks so unprofessional. <laughs> There's no it's reason why that should be 300 megs. That just shows a, a very you know, level of care that's not adequate. Yeah, it's, it's ironic that, that um, especially the, the um, we'll say the most senior folks in the uh, profession, everyone's got one of these now. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and as a result of that, we're the most impatient ones. Mm -hmm. I mean, you guys probably don't remember dial-up, and and the fact that it would take two to three minutes to download a single image. Mm -hmm. Now, if we have to wait, oh, I don't know what, 15 seconds for something to load, that's an oh, eternity. It. And at that no, point, no. if you ever see me lecture, you'll see like it's like, oh, screw it, I'm done, I'm done. Like, let's just move on. Yeah, right. Because so we don't want to waste that time. Yeah, so so you have to. It's not it's not an option. Um, yeah, let me see. If I, oops. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So what to include and what to exclude? Tough question. Um, so again, this one I'm just throwing in because I notice a lot of these summer internships, the deadlines are just around. Are you applying? Just around oh, the good. corner. Um, so again, so they ha they have a you know so they even say how many pages and yeah, a maximum of five megs. That's yeah. That, that one I make is for so we we yeah. have contacts there. We mm -hmm. we should yeah you mm -hmm. should network oh. yeah right. So and then another company summer again mm -hmm. um, ten to twenty pages but five megs. Right. <laughs> right. Um, oh sorry, I'm going the other way. Yeah, I just I'm just using right left it makes it easier. Oh okay. okay. Um, oh, and and um, and a lot of these, um, and I, I'm sure I'm sure this is also uh, many of you already know to do this, but just to cover the basics. So when you're applying to get something from them, yeah. you have to make sure uh, to follow like letter by letter ex ex exactly what it is that they're asking for. 
So read it very, mm -hmm. very thoroughly. You know, if you are bad with information, read it three times, five times. Make sure you understand what is it looking for and you don't exclude yourself from the search process just because of some technicality of that, something you didn't follow. I like to think of it as it's like doing your taxes. This <laughs> is not, this yeah. is not a place, it might work, but this is not a place where you want to test whether they're, they're, it's not a Google interview where they're trying to see if you can read between the lines. They're literally, mm -hmm. we gotta look at 6,000. I mm -hmm. don't wanna break my computer every single time I look at one. Yeah. You know, so if they say cover letter, resume, and two to three work samples, send them that, right? So just follow it exactly. So table of contents. So table of contents um, is a really great way to start to edit what goes in here, in your portfolio, but also in the work samples. Um, Let's see, let's kind of just cover. So it's an opportunity to, s yeah. So um, because uh, I, I saw that too, but then because I put in the format of the five to eight page and mm -hmm. then two to three project, that's why I'm thinking to eliminate the page table content. In the work samples you do, because you're only sending in one or two projects. Yeah, so then you But in your portfolio, yeah, okay. yeah, in your portfolio you would. Yeah. Um, so because like, let's kind of, the, the most mm -hmm. typical, um, you know, pattern that we see is like students typically put in all, most of their studio projects. Um, some of um, like 390 classes and other uh, maybe 230, some other kind of visual classes, like you know something that you, that would convey to the reviewers that you are uh, a visual communicator, that you have this kind of diversity. Um, but which one? But not all of them should be included, or if they are included. So let's say, you know, if you're gonna include um, something from your second or third year, you know, to hold up next to your fourth and fifth year work, right? Because your fourth and fifth year work is going to be that much more mature. Mm -hmm. So then you have to present the second, third year work in a different light, not as an equal, right? Um, and so, so, so that means you have to kind of think about what you have done, what you were able to accomplish and what is the best way to uh, present this, right? So, so in other words, it's gonna be different than what you were asked to do, the studio brief. Mm -hmm. So studio brief might have had certain goals, um, it might have led you through certain steps, you know, to, uh, so that you learn about a new design method, and then you ended up you know, with your project. But now, for the inclusion into the portfolio, you have to proactively reflect on it, because you might not have m met all of the marks, like, let's be frank, it's hard, right? You might have missed something, you might have um, not really gotten to where you wanted to in a certain part of the project, but there are other aspects that you are proud of that, you know, and which is why you choose to include it in the portfolio. So you have to identify what that is. And it's gonna be different what Carol said it was or what I said it was, yeah? And I would, I would add that the portfolio you send into work, no one cares what you did in class. Yeah. It's just, it's not your midpoint review. Mm -hmm. In midpoint, we want to see how did you address what was assigned to you in class. Yep. This is selling yourself. Mm -hmm. So if it means that you're combining projects because it makes sense or that you are, like in my case, I never organize projects by date. I always organize them by typology or by a type like design themes, skill versus specialization. Yeah, yeah themes. Mm -hmm. Thematically, uh, it's, you want to put the best stuff forward, but you want to put it together in a way that, that tells your story. Right. So, like for example, never use the course numbers, the class numbers. It's meaningless to people outside of this department, yeah. right? Um, and never use chronological. So don't start with, this is what I did in my first year, second year, third year. So never do that, because that doesn't show that you're reflecting on what you've learned. Mm -hmm. And also, it's, chances are, your 110 project probably is not your strongest project. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to start with that, because by the time they get to that, they're like, oh, done. Yeah. Right? You're applying what's back and you lose the first them. project yeah. Is, is, yeah, the pavilion, yeah. they're gonna be like, it's not. Yeah. Well, you lost them, right? <laughs> and so come up, try to come up with your own categories, yeah. right? So let's look at a few examples. So tell, so take a second to um, read and tell me, tell us what you think. What do you notice? Does this, does some of this look familiar? Do you recognize some of these studios? From an alum. Aren't or are? They are, they are in order by, by, this, by class. By okay, but, but what do you uh -huh. notice? Or what don't you notice? They're not. Are they titled? 
and you know there's no reference to ARH 450, ARH 350. He's using the project titles. What was important, and he's also adding in. So this isn't from this institution; it's from somewhere else. But he's reorganizing what he's done as an architectural student based on his own categories, and he's placing. So, so let's go to right. So he's mm -hmm. placing 310 in this category, experimentation. That makes sense, and that's how he presents his project. It's not about the building, and I suspect that he didn't quite finish. Right. But he had really good, the first half of the semester, the drawings, analytical models and the drawings. Really, really beautiful. Um, and then these are what he calls buildable designs. Right? And he also included his um, 292 class work. Right? Um, so if we look at another example, what do you think about this one? Also an alum. This looks Mary, the Mary Scott School yeah, of it's Graphic Mary Design. <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> Do you recognize some of the classes? So in this one, you know, she didn't um, give herself a category like the previous student did. Yeah. <laughs> but it's very clear. Yeah. In the name, it has to explain like what type of building. It's like yeah. the first one, like Long Beach, reference yeah. housing. So uh -huh. you know it's a housing. Yeah. And then below, mixed use. Well, you don't have to include that, but in this case, if someone is looking, like if you're, if it's a project or a portfolio like this where you're applying to different Type. types of firms or different specialties, mm -hmm. they can say, okay, I want to, we really deal with mixed use, so I don't necessarily want to see veterans housing, I want to see the mixed use first. It, it just lets mm -hmm. them know that you have a, a wide range of skills that you can mm -hmm. So, So in a way, it informs the... Um, interviewer of the building typology, mm -hmm. right? They can go right to that. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. You right. know, I want to mention the previous one also had the awards, so it's a subtle way to add in those accolades. Oh, that right. last one, yeah. I mean, the, it's a good way. The competition, this one? Yeah, the mm -hmm. spring show and the... And the previous one. Yeah, the spring show and the... Oh, oh it's just right before, yeah, the studio award and the spring show, like in a way yeah. that's a subtle oh. way to say, mm -hmm. yeah. The, mm -hmm. These are my accolades without mm -hmm. throwing it into someone's mm -hmm. face. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah. it's a smart yeah. way to do yeah. it. So, I mean, this is very clean. Yeah. So, in three lines of text, we have the project concept. Mm -hmm. We have um, the, I don't know if these are all occupants, like, you know, some a detail about the, the, the that semester studio, and then the building typology. Yeah, building typology, mm -hmm. or no, these are, well, she could have done this so that it's more of a d building type, so that it's, yeah. you know, this is clear, this is housing, right. high rise, right? So it could have been even more mm -hmm. kind of rigorous, right? So there's project concept, what the studio um, goals were, and what the building type is, because sometimes it's not always, the, the studio goals can be met in different building types, right? Okay, so that's so for her. It happen, also happens to be just a very straightforward reverse chronology, right? But she again, you know, didn't use the course names, which doesn't mean anything to others. Okay, so clear, concise, consistent. So because of this kind of you know reality, um, that's what that's your best defense, right? It has to be really clear, so that they're not trying to figure out what kind of a thinker you are, what kind of a designer you are, what kind of a visual communicator you are. Um, so let's kind of touch on like software a little bit. Um, do you want to make recommendations to yeah, software? Yeah, in design. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, see you guys next week. <laughs> it's, it's real. It's, it's a design tool, but it's also it's a layout tool. It's the industry standard, and um, a lot of vendors won't accept PDFs that aren't um, exported in the right format because it's it's not like for us where we print individual sheets and then clip them together. When you lay out a book, you're actually doing, you can see it on the size of books. It's either four, eight, or 16 pages put together. They're folded, yeah. they're bound, and then so forth. They might need a cut lines. You can organize things in a much more efficient way. Mm -hmm. you, you can, can make bring, changes. You can make changes. Yeah, much you, more easily. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's really no reason. A lot of professionals will even do their boards in InDesign now. Mm -hmm. you, can, you can dump an Illustrator and a Photoshop file directly into the InDesign document. Mm -hmm. So as you make changes to that, you don't have to export it. Mm -hmm. It can get messy, but. Mm -hmm. so, so, and then let, let's kind of, let me give you this perspective also. So your portfolio, let's say that, you know, you do something um, like within the next year. Do you think that you'll come back and open that file maybe in a couple of years? Yeah? 
And what, what do you think, why do you think, what would be the circumstance under which you might, oh, I need to open that file again? A new job? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's say that you, um, you know, you, you got what you could out of, you know, your current employer and now you're looking for another opportunity. Or maybe it's graduate school, whatever it is, right? So you want to set it up properly and you want to make sure, uh, and I think it comes up later, but um, file names, Backup, you know, like not even, you know, <laughs> we'll get to, we'll get to, we'll, we'll spend more time on that. But you want to be as organized as you can because you're going to want those files periodically for probably the next 10 years, mm -hmm. I would assume. 10 minutes now, 10 hours later, your choice. Yeah. There yeah. is no in between. Yeah. I'm paying the price to this day for my thesis <laughs> because apparently, final, 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 Saturday thesis two versus no, really, this is the final versus revision six. It's not funny which now. Which was before, the, yeah, not, not so funny. That way. <laughs> this is the right hard drive even. Yeah. <laughs> okay, um, so what not to do? So because, um, because you have a limit on the image size, the page numbers, it doesn't mean that you should cram because then you've lost the audience, right? Then you've lost the clarity. So don't dump, don't cram, don't reduce your final boards, make them into pages. You have to curate, right? So that means you have to make some decisions about, you might have to exclude some things, right? So you might have to, um, ha you were, maybe you are required to submit certain kinds of diagrams and drawings for that class. But for the portfolio, you might say, that's not part of the brand that I'm trying to present. So I don't need those. And other things are, are more important, right? So you're, you're curating. Do you wanna speak to this a little bit? Sure. Yeah. 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 Um, all right, so there's a, there's a famous designer, Massimo Vignali. He has a, a PDF that we can provide to you guys called the Vignali Canon. And he did the American Airlines and basically every famous logo from the 60s to the 80s you can kind of attribute to him. And all modern designers are like beholden to him. Mary Scott is in the school of Massimo. Kind of. The Vignali Canon. Um, and the first thing is just use a grid, please. Please don't turn every single project and every single page into a unique snowflake that <laughs> is, no, is not like any other. That's great, but it's, it's needlessly uh, expensive in terms of your time, and it's very hard to follow. Mm -hmm. So there's a couple of basic grids you can use, a two column or a three column. I like a six column grid, mm -hmm. because I can then intersperse, I can do three, three, two, four, two, two, two. It gives you some, a little bit of math help mm -hmm. for those of us who aren't yeah. mathematicians. <laughs> Um, templates, this is the fast, fast, fast version of this. By template, what we mean is set up a couple of guides of how you want the story to tell. Imagine if you're, writing a, if you're reading a book. The first page is blue, the second page is red, the third page is upside down, the fourth page is in an angle and it's using actually a different language. It would be very hard to follow where the story is. The template works in the same way. It just sets you up so that the reader can understand what you're trying to communicate. And so all these tools, whether they're graphic design, architecture, whether you're doing your boards, ultimately you're trying to convey a message, you're trying to communicate to the audience. Mm -hmm. So you might have a template that works all of your, for your concept stuff. And you might have a template that works for your, your final um, drawings and renderings, right? Yeah. So you're not reinventing um, the layout each, for each page. But you can break it mm -hmm. once in a while. Mm -hmm. if, if you break it every single page, then guess what? It's not a template anymore. <laughs> but, <laughs> if uh, don't let the, don't become beholden to the template to the point where the project actually suffers, yeah. or where yeah. the message is lost. Yeah, use it as an aid, not as something, not as a street jacket. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so here's one. What what do you see? Is it well organized? Yeah. What's the kind of theme? What's the logic? The staggering. Diagram will be in black. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. So all the kind of the all of the architectural drawings are in the white, and then all of the the process work is in black. However, though, information is like kind of a little bit decentralized. There's no one focus point. Mm -hmm. No focal like point. Know where to start with. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Yep. Good critique. Any other? So so these these were actually boards. Um, as a page, some of these things would be teeny, um, probably too small, like if we're anticipating something like this size, right? Or. Yeah, or like that size. So, so if it's that small and it's illegible and it's not adding information, then it's, it's clutter. Yeah. 
Right. Right. This is a board. This is a 24 by 72 inch board that yeah. I yeah. shrank down. It's like, yeah. no. Yeah. What about this one? Yeah. <coughs> is there a grid and a template and a different areas? Like, you know, pla places for things, right? So it's kind of the, the, the sequence of what she, the, some of the earlier work mm -hmm. here, the final stuff, and then um, structure and skin, mm -hmm. you know. But again, as a page, it would be too cluttered, right? This was a bigger board. Or this one. Very simple. Yeah. Like it's a very straightforward use of the grid, right? So that's, I believe that was a module, and I think this is too wide, and this is three or four wide, something like that's that. Like three. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right? So there's a, there's a grid underneath this. And he's deciding, you know, how many for each module, each block. What about this one? It's just the first gut reaction. Does it look organized or does it look haphazard? Yeah. And is there a sequence to things? So there's, right, so there's context and um, the device, the architectural device that, that you, um, propose as, a, as in response to the context, and then the architectural proposal, right? A very simple, straightforward sequence that, um, you know, would apply to any design project. So are, are you saying you can use words on the page to help the reader <laughs> organize? L label how things, to yeah. <laughs> Mind. <laughs> um, so I think, let's do the, do you want to do the text in the font? Sure. You want me to jump forward? Yeah. Yeah. All right, we're going to jump forward mm -hmm. a little bit. We had some technical issues. We have but ten, 10 minutes. Sh yep. sh 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 we'll come back to this. Yeah. Or they'll come back to it. Yeah. Save rhythm and pace. Very important. How to tell a story. Yeah. Dum, dum, dum. <laughs> Publishing. We'll get to that. We'll get to this. All right. So some of these guys, we'll get to that. Yeah. All right. <laughs> we're not going to get. I, 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 I made a promise we're not going to get into the whole debate about fonts and typefaces. They don't really matter as much anymore. but. A couple things. Um, again, how many of you guys have backgrounds in typesetting? The, the person we showed in the beginning actually spent 10 years as a typesetter before she went into graphic design. Nobody? Then, then, then don't get a PhD in typography in the 20 minutes that she decide what font to use. <laughs> Less is more. Right. Uh, Vignelli said that there are only five tape faces that a designer will ever need. Sure. Um, you can probably get away with one or two. I'll show you guys some examples. And there's variations within the typeface. Sizes, uh, mm -hmm. kerning, the, the typeface style are using all caps, sentence case, or the casing. Um, oh, God. Proofread your text in your portfolio. So one of my, my portfolio from grad school was in a, was published in a book on portfolio design, where they put my name, they misspelled my name <laughs> in the title, and underneath it, they spell my name correctly, which I'm like, all right. And then the first line reads something like Daron Serban or Doran Serban on the title. He's really interested in, in text and the idea of communication and therefore spends an endless amount of time proofreading. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> all right, never working with them again. But just please spend, spend, give it to someone else. There's a mm -hmm. reason editors exist. Mm -hmm. Bribe someone with a coffee or even hire an editor to actually proofread your text or God forbid, give it to a teacher, instructor, mm -hmm. or someone. Maybe someone who has a degree in the language that you want to speak in that understands flow and understands mm -hmm. how to not make grammatical mistakes like your name. You'd so be what, I, what, what you should never assume is that, oh, it's, it's a visual layout. It's, the text is so small. It's just there. It's a compositional element. Like, no one's going to read that. No. The, the chances are no one will read no one. Uh, very few people will actually read it. But just a single typo, right, that, that catches, yeah. like somebody notices. Like that, so now they yeah. form that, that judgment, that impression. That Today's the wrong letter. Yeah. Tomorrow it's the challenger, and you forgot to put in a couple of bolts. What's yeah. the big deal? Mm -hmm. right, it's just a, just a spaceship. Mm -hmm. there, um, there are some, just yeah. very quickly, there are a couple of key words that we always use that tend to be misspelled. Mm -hmm. So the word chapter became cheapter. <laughs> I, I just, you know, yeah. that continuously mm -hmm. gets repeated. Mm -hmm. And the other one is precedence. Oh, so, yeah. so you just have to be very conscious because this is our language. <laughs> yeah, presence. Yeah. Yeah. So, th there, so share amongst yourselves mm -hmm. what are the key words that you need to pay attention to. Yeah. Um, yeah. This is probably yeah. my biggest pet peeve. Not probably, this is definitely my biggest <laughs> pet peeve. Uh, yeah. Imagine that Braden Engel, who gave a talk a couple weeks ago, mm -hmm. last week? Yep. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. last week all right. So imagine he is standing right behind you. Uh, whenever you list off who worked on a project, 
just because uh, Vu and I did a project and this is my portfolio does not mean that Vu no longer exists mm -hmm. and therefore I did everything. So plagiarism is real. Um, and they can usually tell because oh in comparison to your other projects that were done solo, the group work, like, like I usually go, oh, oh, there's the, the team, yeah. team's mm -hmm. name, right? Or, or they can usually multiple tell. people submit the same project yeah. to the same firm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That does not look good. Mm -hmm. So. And it's not professional. Unless. So, so yeah. it's, a, it's a bigger blemish than a typo. <coughs> Because they, they can count it as either you were so ignorant that you didn't know to credit mm -hmm. your partner, or it's willful. Yeah, right? and then it's identity theft, you know, yeah. identity fraud. And um, <coughs> Unless you're Glenn Murcott and you can win a Pritzker Prize by never working with anyone else because you're such a nightmare <laughs> to work with, <laughs> guess what? You will work with other people in the profession. There's no such thing as a sole practitioner anymore. It doesn't Even if they say they are, they're still working with other people. Yeah. So it's actually a good thing to show, hey, I can collaborate. Mm -hmm. I can I can work with someone else's opinions. I'm not just making this up on my own, by myself, in a closet, locked away. You know, one of my, my first intern, um, uh, was through a class, like I was still in school, one of my first intern positions, um, that's what was my takeaway. So, mm -hmm. you know, what was explained to me is that, so in school, it's, for the most part, it's your project. You are responsible for making the decisions for, and for completing the project. But in, a, in practice, that's never the case, even for sole practitioners. Mm -hmm. And so in an office, um, you, you always say we. You never say, I did this, my meeting, I have to do this. You always say, we have to do this, we have a meeting, right? But, and that really, you know, and so, some, so after that point, it, I would kind of like perk up. I would um, notice more. Mm -hmm. And I would always look, and it's always somebody who's very junior, right? So the person who says, I have to go to my meeting now and present my, you know, drawings and this and that. that. And so it kind of starts to, I, I, I started to realize from that point on that it really does separate somebody who's really, really naive. Right, who hasn't been taught that lesson to somebody who understands that it's a fundamentally collaborative practice and that it doesn't matter if you do the drawing, it's still a team effort. So always we, yeah. Mm -hmm. And Ms. Faculty, the only reason I would do this uh, and we suggested is you never, architecture is a very small profession. Mm -hmm. And so I've been on multiple interviews on both sides where I either recognize the faculty or they recognized my faculty, and it immediately changes mm -hmm. the conversation. Yeah. All right, so a couple of examples. How many typefaces do you see here? One. Can you differentiate between the different elements? Like bold to... Yeah, like we got, we got but would that be this stuff, this stuff, I, I don't know, I don't... <laughs> yeah. I thought typeface was just a style. For, for brevity. Yeah. <laughs> How many typefaces? One. One. But there's different styles within that typeface, different fonts, if you will. Dis I'm disagreeing with myself from five minutes ago. So using, <laughs> using, you know, how many different sizes? There's four sizes on this. So we've got the body, which is the main area of text. Disregard the, uh, when you pull off a PDF and bring it into Illustrator, for some reason it, on, this, on Helvetica, it turns every space into uh, this little capital E. Mm -hmm. But yeah. Helvetica knew. Massimo Vignelli again said, start with the body. That's the main, the biggest amount of text. And then you can use a ratio to decide how you want to do it. You know, if it's less important, make it smaller. These books, notice the biggest thing is nine. You would never turn an essay in, in your history class in size nine because it's tiny. But when you have this or this size, if you ever open up a book, just take a look at how small they are. Normal size is six to seven. Um, just because your eye reads it differently. A different one. In this case, again, totally unrelated. One was from Syracuse. This is from Buffalo. He is a, an editor and, and was a, an award-winning graphic designer and advertiser and photographer. But again, one, two, three, four, five, six. All of them use the exact same typeface, but it reads totally different. You can tell, like, what is this? Not typeface, but what, what is the communication of it? Yeah, and then your professors. Mm -hmm what is actually happening, and then even this extra information. So it's, it's a way of differentiating what your eye should be focused on. And this one is from SciArc. And I just randomly pulled these out, and they, uh, they happen to be like this. Is, these are slides from, from a different class. But it's important to show that these were random people. And when we look at them, what we realize immediately, I did the eye thing. See, I was naughty too. Um, but what we, 
what we realize is that there are certain traits that attract us immediately. And if everything on the page is different, your eyes are going to get scrambled and you're not going to know what to focus on. So you can mm -hmm. create differentiation between a title, the body again, the placement. You can have pages on the bottom or on the top depending on what the <coughs> flow is. But three different universities, uh, probably 15 years of difference between the first one, which is like an 04, and the last one, which is uh, maybe 10 years. I think this is like 2014. Mm -hmm. uh, but they still have a lot of the same characteristics. That was the fast, fast, fast version. Should we jump into the photograph or should we rewind? Um, what's the photograph? Yeah. What's that? Yeah. Photos? Yeah. All right. So this is that. This is this guy again, right? Award-winning photographer. Is this? Notice this is not a photo of a model. This is art, right? I mean, you could frame this, and it'd be perfectly fine. This doesn't look like you shot it on his desk at two o'clock in the morning with his iPhone. Even though this is 04, so the iPhone didn't exist. Um, it can be a book cover. Yeah, it can be. In fact, it it, it is mm -hmm. his book cover. Yeah. So. Um, it's important that it conveys a message. It tells you, like, when you look at this photo, what, what can you tell about him as a designer? Nelia, what do you think? Detailed. Yeah, detail-oriented. Mm -hmm. Krish, what about you? Precision. Precision? Yeah, so this is not a person who just kind of closes their eyes and does everything. I mean, if anyone has soldered, you know that these details are just staggeringly difficult to do, and all the materials fit in a way that even the, the photo itself, it focuses on this precision, this craft. Mm -hmm. This person is obsessed with detail. Because I don't know if you have tr um, tried to take eye level photos. It's extremely difficult to have that photo look good because it yeah. reveals the lack of detail or the, I mean, even if you're ex um, extremely um, precise and have good craftsmanship, to, um, to stand up to this level of scrutiny, eye level photograph, it's very difficult. This person also used the foreground element as, a, yeah. as an advantage yeah. to mm -hmm. the piece itself. So mm -hmm. there's actually thoughtful composition and, and it's purposeful. Mm -hmm. Like the precision comment, mm -hmm. it's aligned. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. yeah, the verticals are vertical. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so when, when you shoot, again, process photos are great and you can include them in your portfolio, but for, for the hero shots, for beautiful photos, make sure that you have diffuse light. So unless your project is all about the movement of light in the day, mm -hmm. chances are having, taking it out in, in the middle of the night or and using a spotlight on it or um, doing it out in the, the parking lot is not the best idea because just look at the way products are advertised uh, in TV shows or in commercials, in magazines, in books. It's, it's about showing it in the best possible light. And oftentimes, because we're not dealing with those other elements, doing it in a diffuse light, meaning indirect, meaning don't take your iPhone and, yeah, don't, don't, yeah, my phone is, dying. yeah, this is not a good way to photograph this model because the shadow is gonna become distracting. Mm -hmm. So there's various ways to do this. You can always talk to photographers. You, we have a photo lab now mm -hmm. set up. Yeah. Um, so that's right there, right? Um, does anybody, everybody know this? that this is available in the Aaron's office for student use, yes. So I, I believe like, you have to check in with her. She has a camera that you could borrow, um, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So all, this is available to all undergrad, grad, all architecture students. So if OU, don't wait until the end of the semester when you're frantic and tired. You do, if you like, do it like every, I don't know, like Friday afternoons. Like go in there and take photographs of your progress models. And an industrial, or build your own industrial design. We were in that building yesterday, and they have a bunch of these set up around the building, but they're hard shell ones, so they're mm -hmm. actually built mm -hmm. out mm -hmm. with the the scrim, so that you don't get you don't get shadow. You guys know why there's a curve at the end? No shadow. Yeah. So ambient occlusion. When you, whenever two surfaces meet each other, you get that shadow, and mm -hmm. you want this thing. You want what basically called an infinite background. Mm -hmm. But let's say that you know it's your rest for time, and you don't have you know Erin left, and it's you know nighttime. Yeah. You can improvise, yeah. right? Tracing paper, desk arm lamps, we all have these, right? Or you can improvise at home next to a window. Just put something, a sheet of vellum next yeah. to the window. 
we actually have that little dark, um, room in the near the computer room, yeah. the mm -hmm. back side. That's you just right. ask the mm -hmm. host to get you in there. But mm -hmm. Karen and Dorana correct. You do have to improvise because that room isn't set up as nice as Aaron's mm -hmm. studio. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to yeah. use natural light, which by the way is fantastic, yeah. it's still life. Where should the where should the window be facing? What direction should it? Let's just say what direction should it not be facing? It should be facing. Should be facing north. Because what was the first thing? What's the absolute thing we want? We don't want. No direct light. We don't want direct light, which means. If it's facing north, you're going to get a nice even light most of the time. Mm -hmm. Unless you do it right in front of like an emergency light, in which case, <laughs> I have done that. OK, and then there are different reasons why you take photographs, right? Mm -hmm. So this model, I mean, you know, it's not like um, the, the welded, the soldered model. So it's not to show off craftsmanship. What, what is it? What is it? So no, you know, I mean, I labeled it, but right. See again, <laughs> labels are they're useful, <laughs> right? So so when you take photographs of your models, and I think this is especially true uh, true for a lot of the undergrad students where you don't have the rendering skills yet, and so the the bulk of or the most um, of the compelling images are going to be your model shots, not your renderings, <coughs> right? So when you take photographs of your model, you're not just snapping away mm -hmm. without thought. You're actually thinking about how am I presenting this project and how does this model help me explain that story, right? So there are models like this where you get an eye level. It's not about detail. It's about this experience, okay? Or there's things like this yeah. where you, you um, it's a diagram mm -hmm. um, in the form of a photograph where you explain how something operates, how something works, yeah? And then there are things like this. This is what Duran, right? So this is the mm -hmm. one time where the messy background is part of the, the, the intent, right? These are process models. They're not precious. It's something that helped you to figure out something, make a decision, right? But they're all pulled mm -hmm. together. Um, you know, so the colors have been um, uh, adjusted in, in Photoshop so that it doesn't have you know, the warm light of this desk arm and the cooler light of the natural daylight. It's all even, right? It's all, it looks like they're a set. And there's something <coughs> important on the right side? Label. No. Sourcing. Sourcing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, citations. Yeah. Yeah. Even on a dumb PowerPoint, you still have to include that in there. It's not our images, therefore we mm -hmm. cite yeah. it. So and then back up and then I think yeah think all right so too. so um, there's nothing that I enjoy more than than when you come to me and say can I, can I get my files from seven and a half years ago because I, I didn't back them up well I backed them up I mean I put them on a on a thumb drive and I kept that thumb drive attached to my keys that I um, lost like twelve years ago so can I yeah or all the other methods three two one back up your stuff so you should have three copies of all your work at all times. Spend the extra hundred bucks to, to do it. We all spent more than that in graduate school or in, in architecture school. I'm assuming your tuition was more than a hundred dollars. Yeah, <laughs> it's the cheapest hundred dollars you'll ever get. So one version resides wherever you do your work. Second version is somewhere else. Do not put your backup on the same hard drive or in the same computer because you have two hard drives in your computer as the original. And then a third copy of it should be in yet a different location. Meaning, I would probably do today the web, yeah, in the sky, in the clouds, Dropbox, mm -hmm. Google Drive, Crash Plan, any of those things, just somewhere else where you can't access it. Because I guarantee you, you're going to lose it. We, the story now is kind of infamous. Of yeah. we had a thesis student two weeks before her her presentation, she was very good about it. She followed pretty much all those rules. She had an external hard drive. Mm -hmm. She had her computer. She went to Whole Foods. Mm -hmm. She um, left it on her. No, she put it away. No. She, yeah. she actually put trunk, it in the trunk. Covered with the jacket, out of view. Ten minutes later, yeah. she did not have a thesis anymore. Yeah. Oh. And because she had kept her backup with her computer, that was the only backup. And that was an incredibly painful. It was very painful. traumatic. Yeah. I mean, for her and for it us. It was traumatic. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So don't put yourself in that situation. Yeah. 
Um, and when you do that, just get into a good, um, you know, once you kind of set up, you know, the file management, like some, whatever logic that you use, you know, you can use course names or dates, but once you set it up, then it's a time saver, right? Because you have now a logic, you know, so next time you name a file, um, you know, there's a, you, you can, so that two years later, five years later, you can come back and rec find where, you know, what you're looking for and recognize without having to open every single one. And you should have a hierarchy. So what is the most important thing should always be at the front of the document, document name. So if you, if you decide that I want to organize all my projects by the client first, and if the client is the studio, then fine, all right, ARH 410 slash. That way I know that all of my 410 stuff will be together. And then I recommend a chronology, year, month, day. Mm -hmm. The reason is we have those date stamps on the files, but if you copy a file, it, yeah. it changes the metadata. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I like to know that I can organize all my files. I do it always by date, and I do year and four numbers, mm -hmm. dash, month, month, day, day. Mm -hmm. And that way I can immediately see if, if there's a later <coughs> version or a new version. And then I go completely uh, obsessive compulsive with client name, client type, project name, project type, uh, file version, file number. So it might be like, 2017 dash, what's today? 0316 mm -hmm. dash um, uh, AAU dash ARH, uh, uh, whatever it is, uh, <laughs> professional preparedness <laughs> slash uh, presentation slash what version are we? Version three, mm -hmm. so forth. And that, that way I can see that which version it is. And it's, it looks ridiculous when you see the file name, but when I organize all of them, I can actually find it mm -hmm. if I need to. Mm -hmm. It's just a pain to write mm -hmm. out. Yeah. And for how many of you have cloud backups? Good for you. The rest of you, you should, you should do it. You should do it. Yeah. Um, OK, so we're going to skip back to All right. do, yeah. you, do you need so, to go or do you Yeah, want I to need stay? to okay. actually teach a class on this topic. So. OK. <laughs> Ironically enough. OK, so we're going to go back to where we were. Thank you. Don't no worry. problem. Yeah. should probably take this off before. You guys don't have to believe what I just did. <laughs> All right. So composition. So when you have, um, so we'll talk about a few things in organizing um, a document. You know, whether it's physically printed or digitally browsed. You know, that's organized through a series of pages. So composition is one of them. Um, and you know, I love looking at. You know, this the MoMA show, by the way, um, is excellent because it puts Stephen Core next to Matisse. So it's a side note plug-in. Like, yeah. it's excellent. Yeah, you should go good. see it. But I love looking at Stephen Korn's paintings because I, I just love the depth um, that he's able to achieve, even though the painting is flat. It almost looks like a, I mean, it's a, it's a kind of a, you know, we can recognize the fields and the streets and the houses. But for the most part, the depth is really shallow. Um, but it's really, the, the composition is very dynamic. And there's depth in the composition because of the, the elements that he's using. You know, so this kind of a, like almost a datum, like we would call this a datum in, you know, in our profession. And, you know, something big, something that's much finer grained, uh, a, a slight diagonal here, um, and then another one. So again, it's a very, it's a, you know, flat piece of, you know, two-dimensional graphic, but there's um, organizations, there are different zones, right? So there's things that organize. There's kind of this upper part where there's more coloration and the, the shapes are smaller. And down here, it's more neutral and more nuanced and they're bigger. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, you can you can get lots of take lots of cues from um, other professions and other people who spend their time comp on composition, composing, right? So what you want to do is you want to compose your spread, not you know this separate and this separate but you're, you're composing this, because that's how it's viewed, right? Um, together as a spread, right? like this, right? And so, so this is, um, you know, left page and the right page. And even though they convey different information, um, mm -hmm. you know, the, the colors and kind of, oops, um, the, these kinds of, um, these use of the colored um, areas, you know, to suggest the diagonals, it all ties it together. Right, so it reads like the two pages belong together. It's read as a spread, and same thing here. Mm -hmm. And in this one, so that even though the images are different, you know, this kind of a, a drawing at the bottom runs across both pages, right? To again unite the tie the pages. It's like a datum for that page. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. 
Um, and then mm. white space. So this is really hard to do, especially if you have to, you know, if you're trying to, it's hard to do if you're trying to squeeze too much information into a limited amount of space because you're trying to, you know, uh, cap the, the page numbers mm -hmm. or the file size. But it's the, it's the worst thing you could do is, is cram, right? We, yeah, we actually have an example for mm -hmm. everyone to see. So, com so that's, this is a nice compliment to this one mm -hmm. where, and well, you'll have an opportunity to look at this piece, mm -hmm. but this has a lot of white space, but it's also very effective uh, as a thesis book that mm -hmm. became the portfolio. Mm -hmm. And this is the a la Mary Scott method. Right, yeah. right, right. Um, and this one has, uh, has white space in a slightly different way. So, you know, in these kinds of pages, there's um, texture, but it's, it's, an, it's a graphic um, device that actually ties all of the pages together. And it, it still does its job because, you know, what White Spaces does is all of these things, right? It just, it's a breather, um, you know, before you head into something that is more dense, you know, there's more information for you to discern. Um, so, so white space is really powerful and you should always look for that white space when you do your portfolio layouts especially when you have too much information that you're trying to fit in because it ensures that you're not going to clutter because you know as soon as you start cluttering and it, it, there's less hierarchy and it's hard to kind of navigate mm -hmm. you've lost audience right they're going to skip that page yeah. um, so like this right so um, in in white space so th in this spread um, I like because it's an example of I mean, the, the white space in the middle um, is in the, in the middle, so to speak, and then all of the information is actually pushed out to the sides. And at the same time, these are kind of like eye-level photographs of very detailed shots. It's not meant to convey the, the, how the model is made or you know, uh, mm -hmm. a precise um, and accurate photograph of the model. It's, it's more of a, a mood and, a, and an atmosphere, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so, so images like this where it's eye-level and it's full bleed, it's very immersive. Like it, it draws the, the viewer in, the, the eye in. Um, and those are really effective and it's a good way to set up the rhythm. Right, so to so that it's not monotonous. Um, so size, so mm -hmm. things that are bigger get yeah. more attention. Things that have more white space around them get more attention. Um, and contrast, where you know whether it's black or white or inverse, get more attention. So those are all ways to create hierarchy. So let's kind of look at study this one together. How would you critique this? Is there a hierarchy of information? Yes. Yeah. What do you, what, how, do, how do you, um, where does your eye go first? And what, what is the sequence of the, this little um, you know, information that you take in? You start with the, yeah, you mm -hmm. start with the project, right? So um, for, so this spread and the way of presenting this project, project tells us that um, this site context and this kind of a roofscape was a really like you know basically the first piece of information that he wanted to convey about the project, right? So it's smack in the middle. So it wouldn't work um, if there was a, a gutter here. So you know mm -hmm. if you had a gutter here, so you have to adjust it so that you put the the image out of the gutter. But for a spread like this, um, it works. Okay, so you start there, and then what do you where do you go next? Down. The here. Yeah. I went to this. Yeah. Right, because again, it's a white background and black lines, whereas this is, um, the contrast is less. So these are very thin white lines against the color of the water. And so just visually, this pops out more. And I see, okay, like in three steps, you know, he's explaining what they're trying to do. So that fits together, so that's good. And then some, um, you know, hand-drawn sketches that show the proposal, the architectural proposal. Mm -hmm. So diagram, abstract, idea, proposal, and section the money shot, and then, you know, I didn't even read, like, they were too small, so I can see that there's some kind of a lot of site studies, you know, that led to um, this, this decision, but for me, this was the lowest in the hierarchy, right? So you want to kind of anticipate how mm -hmm. the eye is going to move around, yeah? What about this one? What do you take in first, and what's the sequence? Is there a hierarchy? We just used to read from uh, top to bottom to from mm -hmm. uh, left to right. Unless there's something else like sure. uh, to track attention. Mm -hmm. so we all like to read just like from top to bottom. Right. 
this one, the first band that comes to my mind, which is that kind of whatever it's called, floor plan or something. I don't this know shape. Know what that is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like this? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the so in this case he's using the color black to mm -hmm. contrast against the white. And so this is the biggest and the contrast the highest, right? It's a big black shape against the white. So your eye starts there. And then you kind of move around, the diagonal helps, you kinda move around, there's another kind of medium black against the white. And then there's much smaller pieces of information now inverted, so white against the black. And so visually, this helps to kind of anchor. It almost works like a pedestal for mm -hmm. this. Um, so it looks balanced, mm -hmm. right? And so this image, um, so to um, complement this, is also full bleed. Whereas these are, uh, this is much lighter in gray, and these are floating. There's a lot of white space around it, right? So that's, so there's a, there's a nice sequence to it that matches the hierarchy. Okay, rhythm and pace. So in the next one, so this is what um, Duran was referencing. So we, we use a grid, we use a template, you know, we want there to be consistency, but we don't want it to be uh, too repetitive, right? So in the next seven, I'll just uh, flip through them. I want you to just imagine, you know, flipping through a book and just pay attention to how you're processing the visual information. Was there some diversity? Yeah. yeah. Um, what, what was the, did you kind of glaze over? Did it seem too repetitive? Or did it seem like there was enough variety in kind of the density and the release, right? So it's all intentional. So she's laying out the pages with that specifically in mind. So we have something here, um, a big image, a lot of white space. Um, another big image, white space in the middle, small images. And then we go horizontal. So this is a full, um, you know, left and right pages. You know, the image spans across the two here, and this is left white. And now we have the full bleed. This is the immersive image, right? So you're really drawn in. And then we come back out to full bleed on the left, a lot of white space on the right. And now a lot to do. Um, so at this point, you know, so like she would share with me that she was coached not to do full bleed. Uh, in, a, in the same location because Mary Scott felt that that was too repetitive, right? Mm -hmm. And so now here, it's not quite full bleed. There's a little bit of margin, some white space, and more white space there, right? And then you end with something that floats, like without going to full bleed. So there's really only two full bleeds. So full bleed on the left, full bleed in the full, right? So that kind of, you know, what your eye does and how you take in information, that flow and rhythm is what she's using to make those decisions about um, the margins. Okay. Um, and I think we have to kind of run through this a little bit. But so this kind of goes to, you know, who the what the audience is looking for, what what they're looking for. So it isn't just skills, it is it's definitely not your rendering skills. It's, you know, can you think? Um, so to do that, you have to kind of lead them through the process. It has to be a logical sequence of information that you would have followed in, in developing your studio project, right? Mm -hmm. um, so think of it as a story, right? There's usually some kind of an opener, right? And then, you know, there's kind of like experimentation and development and then the final thing, the, the building. Um, so here's a page. So I'll kind of run through the whole. So we have this followed by this, this, and this. Right? So five spets. So is there a sequence? This is this represents what do you take glean from this? Research. Ha yeah, it's research about building types, about this kind of catalog of typologies, mm. um, studio unit, single family housing. So it's not quite her project, it's not about the site yet. It's research into the typology. And what do we have here? some site. So now we're intervening on the site. And um, additional typology, a little bit more detail. So from these single line diagrams, now we have scale figures, materiality, and application on the site. And what, what, how would you uh, describe this page? It's, the, it's now the building. It's architecture, right? It's no longer diagrams. It's an it's a, um, exploded axon that actually describe all, all of the building systems, right, in more detail. 
And what's this? Models. Models. And then finally, the space is, is shown in sections, right? So, so we didn't read a single piece of text, at least I didn't, or I, you know, other than the single family. But how would you guess, so let's say that's the amount of time that, you know, that the reviewer gets to spend on this. What, what did you, what's your impression? Like, what do you think this project was about? Or how do you think she um, developed this project? What would you say? What was she trying to do? So in the end, I think it's, a, it's residential, it's a house. Yeah. It's a house, so this is her proposal for a house. It's very unusual. Um, I mean, you know, so I think it's done very well because, uh, so one, it's very complete. So it's a small project, but, uh, and this one, I believe she had a partner, or maybe she didn't? No, she didn't. Uh, so, so, so first of all, it's complete. The section mm -hmm. is, um, conveys very well the kinds of, it's, it's very integrated. So these kinds of skin and structural system, the spatial qualities, the people, furniture, landscaping, they all help. So there's a level of completion that's a plus. Um, and she's also um, not just kind of drawn it digitally, um, but also used um, these kind of plastic casts, you know, to explore and convey, represent the building form, the formal language, right? Um, and then the, the uh, assembly of the building systems. But it all starts from these studies, right? So she's analyzing, you know, uh, the existing uh, typology of a house and she's making a commentary about um, that the, f the family structure is very different. And the building, the house typology doesn't reflect that diversified family structures, right? So she comes up with a, a new language for a house instead of this. Yeah? Publishing. Should we um, hand out some of these yeah. books? Yes. So what we want to do is share with everyone, mm -hmm. including, was this done with uh, Lulu or Blurb? Blurb. Yeah. Actually, all of these books, except for the square one, <coughs> this was done earlier, but we want to share this with um, all of you, just the experiences mm -hmm. of, um, so separate from this. Maybe we'll pass them. Yeah, we'll pass them out. Mm -hmm. The Barbie project has the portfolio, the studio portfolio attached to the thesis. So we want you to see that you can also think about a compendium, meaning you, you may have your thesis project in one book and your other studio projects in another. In the end, what Agnes did is, um, because this came after this, you know, you have to submit a portfolio for your thesis. She actually made her portfolio book the same size. So there's a volume one, volume two. Mm. So you may think about how mm -hmm. over your career mm -hmm. you would have volumes um, added to your collection, okay? okay? Yeah. And we brought examples from the range of the mm. Mary Scott way of thinking, which yeah. would be the fish food project. Mm. And then there are other ones that Karen and Daron were trying to emphasize. Mm -hmm. as, as long as you think about the format with the grid, you can start creating your own template. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, so n um, nowadays, you know, you will almost, um, you will most likely publish both yeah. um, to get the print books, you know, the physical bound books, as well as um, digital. Mm -hmm. The, for your work samples, uh, most people don't want paper, right? Most people want PDF documents emailed to them. So that's a separate, um, separate kind of a task. Um, the publication of these print books, um, you know, it's, um, so some of you may have, maybe this may be a requirement, some of you may not be, um, some of you may ta be taking classes that support this activity, some of you may, mm -hmm. not, may not, but regardless what the, the circumstances are, it's, um, it's a really good idea and it's a lot easier now, even, even as, as busy as you, you are, mm -hmm. um, to make this, that extra effort to get the book printed say of your portfolio or your thesis um, because um, if it's done well and you've kind of done your best job to represent who you are um, so that you as a designer as a person is reflected in how it's presented in the book you will use this book um, and bring it with you to job interviews long after you graduate mm -hmm. um, Actually, so while you're browsing through that, um, so um, digital, um, uh, sorry, so printing hard copies, so um, uh, you already mentioned, but Bl Lulu and Blurb are two of the co most common ones. Um, the interface is fairly easy, 
And if you have, uh, have any classes with Durant, you would have, I think, published through Lulu, right? So either for 250 or 390 or for both. Um, publishing, publishing online, so issue is um, probably the most common. Um, Behance, um, I haven't come across this um, myself as much, but I know that other kind of visual professions use yeah. this a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, business card, you know, so these places can print them also, but um, there's a, I have an example in here where um, the student, the alumni told me Lou did a good job and it was fairly inexpensive and very quick turnaround. Uh, and when you spend enough effort to kind of figure out, you know, graphically, you know, your, your brand to, to make that all consistent, um, use the same font, you know, typeface, you know, and the kind of same, same graphic um, look and feel for your email signatures and your letterhead as well. So, you know, if you're in your cover letters and your resumes, so make it all consistent. And just as a reminder that, so, uh, so uh, for the students whose projects are chosen to be represented in the spring show, um, you have to have these things printed on paper. Business card, cover, uh, portfolio, and resume, not cover letter. So this is issue. So if you go in there, so it's a, the digital um, is free. Um, so if you go in there, it's a, a, a really great source for you to look up other architecture student portfolios. And you can browse through them and form your own critiques, right? So they might, the interface looks something like this. So when you click on one of them, um, there's some navigation tools down here. And for the most part, you know, you're limited to the size of your monitor. Um, and so they're not print resolution, they're screen resolution, they're fairly small. But this is what it looks like. Um, some examples that, um, from alums, but mm -hmm. I won't go, so you can look at that after this. Uh, and this is what Behance looks like. And this is, these are some examples of business cards um, that they used Moo, M-O-O, -O, to this print. Is Moo. This is Moo. Um, so it comes with a, a, a neat um, case. Mm -hmm. So there's a, like a, a box that you know, has the same kind of colors and same kind of paper. So it looks very perfect. So it's a good place to keep, store them, display them. And the weight of their yeah. cards mm -hmm. are really decent. It's yeah. not flimsy. And yeah. that's actually important, mm -hmm. the feel of that yeah. business card. Yeah. yeah. Because it's, it's one of the most tactile things yep. that in, it's most frequently exchanged. So people really notice. So portfolio examples. Um, so let, let's kind of do a couple, mm. you know, a couple of these spreads and let's you know, comment on it together. So what do you guys think about this one? Looks well balanced. Hierarchy? White space? Yeah. Uh, composed on two sheets, balanced by dynamic, not Ooh. static. Is it clear and concise? Do you kind of get, so this is, he only used, so 350, right, mm -hmm. I think we all recognize. So he only used these two pages. He consolidated all of that work that you guys did in 350 <laughs> into two pages, one spread. Does it convey enough? Do you kind of understand the design intent? Yeah. yeah? Oh, I'm sorry, two, four page, two spreads, four pages. Yeah, it's a little bit more detail, right? Yeah. So this one I like less because it looks mm. a little too cluttered. Yeah. So the, these, um, the, so there's a big image and some small images, but they're too close in size. So you, your eye kind of bounces around, right? So without having that kind of nice, you know, sequence mm. of kind of touring yeah. around the page. So, you know, I think he could have maybe combined this area into one visual mm. field, even yeah. if they're composed of different images. Yeah. What about this one? Is there, kind of, so these are the same, same student, same um, student. Yeah. Do, is there, do you, would you say that there's kind of a, a signature feel, like his style? Yeah. yeah like what the color? So very different than this, right? Different person. Yeah, so he loves to layer, right? So there's mm -hmm. like a lot of layers in this image. Um, but he, he's able to do it in a way where it doesn't distract, you know, it doesn't take away from the hierarchy and the clarity, right? So again, very clear. So big immersive image there, some title and text, and then the diagrams. Okay, so this page, you know, again, I think this is less organized. I mean, it's very clear. So, I mean, this is a, a time where if you're not going to send this as your work sample, if this is your work sample, 
and this is just meant to be kind of the the workhorse that just you know so if he were sitting down you know to an interview he would need all of these drawings to explain the the project right so they're there to serve that purpose um, so then maybe it's a um, especially when you're pressed for time it's a good idea just to follow the template and you don't have to I mean this is a board right that he's spent mm -hmm. a lot of time you know, figuring out the spacing, the fading, the sizes of this, this requires a lot more time. But this is a, a clean, straightforward enough layout that has information, right? Yeah. Um, okay, so I'm gonna skip through all this. <coughs> what about this one in contrast? So a different person. What do you think of this layout? Really, really minimal, but I think it's Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The focus is really clear, right? Yeah. It's all about you know this this slit. I think so it's more about construction methods when mm -hmm. we show this picture of how we do it. Mm -hmm. so right, but it's it's again all about you know this this. So I'm not sure if this was a design studio, if this was a, a component of a studio, but the, what this spread conveys is very clear. It's about you know the study of that light. And mm -hmm. he's using sketches and models to explore and communicate, right? So very, you know, simple, like no layering. It's very kind of flat but clean, and it works. What about this one? So, like, let's kind of look at the images. So here's it's a photographs of the same thing that he made. So here's an image, and here are, what's different between this image and these three images, or these two images? Like finished. Mm -hmm. um, finished image. Yep. Yeah. In progress, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So here's uh, an immersive image, like up close, a lot mm -hmm. of detail. So this is the, the thing, the, the finished product. And then these are, so this is showing how he did it, how he made it, right? Process. Uh, let's skip this. What do you think of this one, this page particularly? Is is there a hierarchy? So actually, in the two spreads, is there a hierarchy? So in this case, he inversed it. So white space is black space. Is there a hierarchy and white space? Yeah. Is there a sequence? At any point, do you kind of like? No, is the sequence less fluid? No? I, I don't like this. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's distracting. Because yeah. everything else, this is well, you know, the balance is nice, the balance between the white and the black, um, this hierarchical, that's all the text, at, you know, helps with the composition, and it's all good. Small image is okay, but then, like nice. this one, the fact that it bleeds over into the image, it goes, this is the only time he, he or she does it, and so it looks distracting. Maybe you don't even need that. So yeah, yeah. Because it's not that much bigger. Right. Not much bigger, and you can't tell. Yeah. And it's meant to be an enlarged detail, yeah. but yeah. it becomes and a. Not that much bigger, right. and you can't actually see side, what it is. Yeah, that whole yeah. Thing. right. So, like, I would remove this, and I would group these together. So, I think these are also distracting because you actually can't read them, it's illegible. Yeah. So, remove them and reduce the spacing in between so that it's much mm -hmm. closer together as a set. So, there's more margin around them. Right? And they should maybe same same scale of. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. Font and text. We did. Model for I think we're at the end. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that kind of any questions or comments? Uh, yeah. Uh, um. So. So. For me personally, I would separate the two. So I'll repeat the question. So the question is, um, is it a good idea to include your resume as kind of your first page of your portfolio? Um, so if you have the, the liberty or the luxury, the ability to print more copies of your portfolio, um, say for different audiences or at different points, uh, because you might tailor, customize your resume mm -hmm. depending on, even if it's, you know, today, you're applying to two different positions, you might tailor, cut, individualize the, the resume. 
So if you're able to do that and have one copy for this application, one copy for this application, or let's say like six months from now, a year from now, you are going to apply to a different job and your resume has to be updated, right? And at that point, if you can reprint your, your whole portfolio, then sure. But if that's not the case, you know, if there are going to be these kinds of books um, that can kind of, you know, co cost, you know, there's a, there's a hefty cost to print them, yeah. then I would keep it separate. Because this is, in a way, these books are, you know, it's a documentation that captures a certain amount of time, like this, this point in time. But your resume is something that you're going to be updating every few months. And Karen's point about how different firms may be, they have, a cert they have certain focuses, so firms that do workplace mm -hmm. versus someone in healthcare, and mm -hmm. yet your skill set may be applicable. You definitely want to bias your resume so that you put yourself in the best light depending on which type of mm -hmm. office you're interested in. Mm -hmm. Any other? Also, noticing, what's the size that you recommend bring a portfolio? Portfolio? Like too big or too small. Too small? Mm -hmm. So the question is, what size um, would you recommend for a portfolio? So this, again, is a, is a very personal decision. So mm -hmm. as you can see, even in the examples that um, mm -hmm. we have, it, it varies. So, you know, I, I, when I was in your shoes, I started out with, you know, bigger is better. <laughs> so I had like these really big ones. Um, but I've kind of come a, uh, done a 180 now. So I just want a standard size because it's easy to mail. It's easy for the person to, you know, maneuver and read. Um, and so when I was younger, I used to think, well, I want to be different. <laughs> Right? So I'm going to go bigger. <laughs> but now I appreciate much more the convenience and ease with which um, this, a standard size will help it be circulated and be reviewed. And mm -hmm. it becomes less of a distraction. Yeah. I still have the big one, but all my other stuff is now <laughs> the letter size. And um, it can also be, I mean, some of these, um, you know, so some of Keep these going. big ones, yeah. you know, I mean, these yes. are, this is something... Um, I mean, there are definitely pros and cons because you're definitely able to. So it's a diff it's a it's a different look and feel. So if you, you know, if you compare these kinds of pages to something that is much smaller, I think Duran had even smaller ones. Yeah, he did. The smaller books, um, the the way you would approach the layout is very different. The smaller books are all about single image on a page mm -hmm. kind of a thing, where this is much more about composing, putting multiple things on the spread. Yeah. Um, so there are definitely pros and cons. Um, but and it, it may also be, you know, so if you have like an inexpensive thing, um, let's say at the end of the review, you want to leave it with the, the person, you know, you can keep that kind of a thing, then maybe a small one would be great. Um, so it's a, it's a personal decision, but in, you know, hindsight, like in my hindsight, just do a standard size. Yeah, yeah, full of good questions. Back uh, my second year, I did, or my third year, I did a chair for one of my class. Yeah. Is it okay for oh, yeah. Yeah. Where, what do you put it under? So the question is, um, so for um, a second third year class, he made a chair as an assignment. And is there a place in his portfolio for that chair? So the answer is, that if it's well made, if it's something that you are proud of to this day, then definitely yes. Um, and so, so then the next question is, well, how do I, what do I, what do I put it under? What do I, how do I categorize mm. it? Um, so the, the kind of the fastest, easiest way, if you have uh, like other things that, that have are kind of odd ducks, orphans, you can just put it under other. Or if you have other similar, so let's say you have, a, you have other, so woodworking, is it woodworking? The, is a chair? Um, so, so if it is like woodworking, then that maybe that could be a category. Maybe of other woodworking, whether it's um, you know part of a, a model that you made for studio or something you did outside of class or something you did before you came to this school. So that can be its own category if it's something that reflects you know your interest and you know what you like to do. I think something that you brought up earlier about you the the theme. Mm -hmm. If there's a theme that can be in the category of fabrication or mm -hmm. making. Mm -hmm and you group your chair with a series of other models that mm -hmm. may have come from other studios, mm -hmm. you can create a grouping that's only about making, right, mm -hmm. or fabrication. I mean, there were two images you put up there. The, there was a white one that had to do with um, 
it was contrasted with the black slide that came after and I immediately thought that that student's portfolio that those pieces that were made and crafted can also be like in a fabrication page right mm -hmm. D different than let's say it was part of a studio project yeah so you have to think through these categories that mm -hmm. you will create Mm -hmm. in your portfolio. Yeah, so I mean that's another good example. So you have to kind of think about why you're including the tear, not just because I did it and it looks pretty good, mm -hmm. but because it tells this thing about me as a designer. Yeah. You know, this is, you know, and this kind of resonates with, you know, another model that I did for a different class because mm -hmm. yeah. I approached it in the same way. Yeah. yeah. I have a comment to add on the yeah. size. So in 250, we were, uh, we were asked to do 8 by 8 size. But then the company we were going to print, they did, they just did seven and a half by seven and a half. So oh. also it's good to check with the company like what size they printed. Yeah, on. Good point. That's a lot really of people did eight by eight, and then when we had to print, everybody had to just shrink it down. Right. So yeah. A chance to achieve. Right. right. That's, that's a really good comment. So yeah. just repeat it. Um, so before you finalize and like do all this work in InDesign on the size, check with the, the printing company mm -hmm. to make sure that they will print at that size. So Krish and his other classmates were in a situation where the company didn't print at eight by eight. They did seven by seven and a half by seven and a half. So like for plug, they had a plug in in InDesign as well. So you can now the plug in and you can design directly on that template so you don't lose any. So, so Vu is yeah. so, so Vu is pointing out that you know so blurb is so prevalent right now. So the blurb and InDesign they're synced, so you can actually call up the templates, mm -hmm. the blurb print sizes within yeah. InDesign, so that you don't end up in this situation. Any other? Yeah. No, just always show your best work. So the question is, um, I, so if I understood correctly, mm -hmm. the question is, you know, should you keep your, let's say, an older project, earlier studio project, as is, without touching it up, so that the improvement between the earlier work and the later work is greater? And my recommendation is that no, just don't put, put in your best work. So yeah. um, in a portfolio, the expectation is that. So nobody will kind of um, fault you for having gone back to an earlier studio project and then reworking it. Nobody will actually, it's expected that if it's in your portfolio, it's because you're, you're, you feel that it's a, it's a good representation of your skills today. Um, um, so, so you should always rework it. Mm -hmm. So as a, as a kind of a tangent to this, um, have you guys had a chance to um, look at, come across a rendering like say from five years ago, maybe even in your own work, or 10 years ago, they look so outdated, right? Yeah. Have you come across physical models from five or 10 years ago? They don't look outdated. So what that means is that um, sometimes you may or may not be able to rework your renderings, mm -hmm. right? To make it, um, to use the, take advantage of the laser softwares. Um, so you wanna be mindful of that when you lay it out. Right? So, so what that means is that the renderings that are trying to look photorealistic, they get outdated like within months. But the renderings where there's an, a very clear intent, so it's mm -hmm. not realistic, but it conveys a point, right? Either because it's a set at a certain time of the day or because it looks, feels more like a collage, less a photograph. Right, so it's it's there's more of an artistry art, mm -hmm. artistry in there. Yeah. Um, those will last longer. Yeah, so always touch it up. Well, yeah, yeah, I think also to your question earlier, you always want to. You also don't want to reveal your weaknesses because you're in competition for a position. So mm -hmm. you're always constantly showing your best work. And I think it was mentioned earlier, you have to edit out. Yeah, right. You have to look at what you have and curate your work. And so mm -hmm. that was that earlier discussion, really learn to just take away the things that mm -hmm. don't really help the presentation. Like for yeah. example, let's say there was a studio where you know you didn't quite get there, mm -hmm. don't put in, unless you have time to rework it and redraw, you know, let's say the section, don't put it in. If it isn't your best section, yeah. don't put it in. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other questions? Okay.